and we'll be working on a project in a committee and I'll say, oh, this is just like the planning process we're doing. I mean, even so now I'm writing about how what we're doing is really writing a plan for Bennington and that it's provisional, but we we're always trying to cast forward what we want and test it. So the, the plan process is a framework that the college has created to allow students to develop their own ideas and connect them with the resources of the college from the curriculum and the faculty to everything that happens outside the curriculum here. So you take the student's interests, the student proposes them in front of a faculty committee after having written about them. Those ideas get approved or they do not get approved or they get revised and they get edited. The student does work in the curriculum and in the courses for field work term and their co-curricular experiences. Um, they get tested in, in every kind of way by these faculty and they continually propose and defend their ideas to the faculty who then help them develop those ideas further and further. This is very much in line with what Bennington, how it was founded, you know, as an experiment in progressive education that was trying to test this idea. I personally feel like it's a, it's a, it's a process of discovery. You know, working with institutional researchers, I'm coming from a literature background, they're coming from science or social science backgrounds. So we really test each other. You know, how does this kind of evidence hold up? What is the storytelling? How do these things go together? And you have to constantly reinvent ways to ask the right question, right? So that people are hearing you. So you get the information that you need and can ask the next question. And I find myself trying to do that all the time. And um, it's exhausting. <laughs> you can leave that part out. <laughs> no, that was great. All of that was great, actually. One, two, three. I think it's a very cool idea. I'm just not sure exactly how I'm going to go about uh, doing it right now. It was part of what attracted me to Bennington. I kind of used the term uh, Build-A-Bear major. I was all in the school at a more ideal level. So I really like the idea of designing your own education. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. No idea. But it was so intriguing and exciting. Like, I'm going to be writing my plan. Like, who gets to do that? It was hard to believe it was a real thing that happened. Yeah, I was just very excited about it. Uh, like, um, what is it called? I'm not a huge fan of the title. I think my working title is something about, like, understanding design in different cultures or something like that. It was a fairly insignificant title. I can't really give a title to it because I haven't written a new one. So my plan, the title is Grow, Cook, and Eat. Who no, it's How to Bring a Meal to the Table, Grow, Cook, and Eat. And it's in three parts, growing, cooking, and eating food. My, my advisor, Donald, didn't want me to, to do the colon plan title. To, you know, like, I don't know, like, rigor mortis, colon, death and life and in, in modern day anthropology. I don't know. And it's like every flying title has like really cool colons and I wanted that, but he was like, no, you gotta go to the point because you're an architect, you're student. <laughs> I was a freshman and a, so in, well, a sophomore in the days of um, the plan title didn't really matter and you came up with it as an afterthought. The title was Drama as a Vehicle for Cultural Awareness. Accidental requirements. I want to learn this, but like if I don't have some kind of pressure, it's going to be hard to get myself to do it. And like grades are one way of doing that. The more you the more you learn, the more you want to know. Yesterday was one of the most inspiring days of my entire life. I woke up just like any other day, and I had lunch, and I was feeling fine about everything. I my high school professor, my English professor, would always say that. A normal state of being is melancholy. Like that, there's nothing wrong with melancholic. Like that means you're okay. Like that's the usual, the ordinary, which I don't know if I agree with. But for whatever, whatever an ordinary day was for anyone, that's how I felt. And then I went to Mark Wunderlich's Emily Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson class. He gave us this sheet in the beginning of class that you're supposed to write down your biggest fear. And my two biggest fears were electricity and poetry. <laughs> Um, but here I am taking poetry, and we had to come to class prepared with a poem, and I, I chose um, a poem by Emily Dickinson. The first line was, there is a languor of the life more imminent than pain. Um, and we all stood up in front of the class and recited our poem one by one, one by one. And then he gave us a history lesson about Emily Dickinson. And I 
I've never been less distracted in my life. I felt so engaged with what he was saying. And I wanted to be a writer in that moment. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be a musician. I could have gone anywhere on campus and I would have been satisfied because I would be doing something that I love. And I felt no restrictions. I don't know. I've never felt that way before, though. Usually it's a very distinct series of events that leads to me being overwhelmingly inspired. And I get inspired all the time. I'm very vulnerable to it. And it's dangerous at times. And it comes from the most unusual places. I'll be like... I remember going to a museum once, and there's this whole entire exhibit about underwater biology, and I was I was in disbelief. I thought it was wonderful. I'm never going to be a biologist ever in my life. And I left, and my dad's like, what did you think? And I was looking up, and there's just an airplane flew overhead. And I was like, it was nice. And I get in the car, and he assumed that I was, like, drawing bio, biological things. I was just drawing airplanes. I... It just, inspiration is the strangest thing. I don't know how it works, but this place is so, it's everywhere. You can find it anywhere. And I just thought that was one of the most wonderful things ever. And my friends, like I just at lunch had a great conversation about love, which I don't remember really having with my friends back home. I think that the, you know, there's confusion that results from not having the right information and not, and therefore not being able to know how to do something in the right way or in the right sequence or with the right people. And then there's a different kind of confusion that results from learning more and understanding the complexity of what you're studying or of what's going on internally for yourself. And I think that latter kind of confusion is often what happens during the plan process in a way, I don't know if I'd advertise this, but in a way this is designed to create a particular kind of confusion or uncertainty as you are discovering things, right? You're, I mean, you know, the, the map metaphor is, is overused, but it's useful if you're constantly trying to push on unknown territory or territory that's unknown to you. Right, that's going to cause a little bit of anxiety and confusion as you're trying to figure out, you know, is this a mountaintop or is this a river? I'm about to go off the edge of the earth. Where am I exactly? Can somebody please help me? So as you're learning more about any given subject, right, you, you I mean, we've all had this experience. And you realize, oh, what, you know, what I thought was true really isn't true. Then I need to really understand the complexity of the situation. How, how can I figure this out? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? What book do I read? Now, that's a necessary part of learning, I think. And what you don't want is, of course, the unnecessary confusion that results from, like, mixed messages from, you know, whomever about what, what somebody should be doing. But there's a confusion that's useful. The, the trick is in making sure that everybody understands that you are going to be confused, <laughs> right? Um, and it's the right kind of confusion, right? You need to be questioning. If there was no confusion and no doubt and no uncertainty, it would make me wonder why we're not questioning the things we should be questioning, just as a matter of curiosity even, not just knowledge, but understanding how things work. And, and frankly, I think that, that as we're you know, using the plan process and the curriculum and the, and the advising relationship to show students how to, to engage students with this kind of learning, you want that to go well beyond Bennington, right? You don't want that just to be here. So we're trying to create a process that students can take with them. So keep thinking about it in those terms. And it's a, may, it's a way of, of lifting your head up to always look at, you know, down the road and be building what you want to get to as you're, as you're going there. And you see this, I think, in, in, in Bennington, that kind of outlook. And I think that's really exciting. I think there's a, a kind of new, newfound sense of connectedness after having gone through the, the, the entire plan process. Last term, there was a lecturer that came here, and I forget what university she was coming from, but it was a lecture on Italo Calvino, on Invisible Cities. 
and it was like on his on, on Calvino's process. The and the lecture. I mean, I went to the lecture just because you know it's like well, I'm I'm, I'm interested. I read the book like three years ago. Um, for a class, for an architecture class, actually. You know, it's like stereotypical architecture student favorite book. It's like, oh, Invisible Cities. I mean, it's a fantastic book. Calvino's amazing. And the lecturer started talking about how, why Calvino would even describe these kinds of spaces in the mid-50s, 60s, early 70s. And she says it was like a historical survey of what the architectural train of thought was at the time in France and in Paris. And was just, I never connected the two of her saying these were the architecture firms that were at the forefront of architectural drawings and all of them were interested in utopian architecture. If he's interested in these spaces and you know and then and it was that was the cool part of the lecture is that I had I had the, the epiphany of the term that during that lecture because she explicitly said to these architects utopia wasn't uh, a solution really but it was a means to find the solution to sort of like push the envelope as far as it could go to learn something in the process because it was just like sort of like a, a, a creative way to force yourself to think outside of the box and calling it utopian architecture and that was exactly what I wanted um, in a very serendipitous fashion um, and it was only after hearing that lecture that I realized that that was what was missing um, it was sort of like this speculative nature that architecture can have um, and now it completely shifted my architect my senior work into that it's a it's going to be architectural drawings uh, that explore utopian um, interventions for Guayaquil, Ecuador's current urban problems. So it's sort of like a, you know, a very self-informing sort of thing. And it's kind of scary to think, what if I didn't go to that lecture to begin with? I'll probably be writing a paper right now. <laughs> to my grandparents, I would probably say, I'm studying agriculture or I'm studying food and agriculture. Because my, my grandparents would be like, oh, that's great, and then kind of like take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> to my roommate, oh man. When I'm going more in depth, I usually explain my plan. Like, I'm kind of, I'm studying food and agriculture the way that a painting student studies painting. So like, a painting student doesn't have a question about painting. A painting student wants to learn how to paint, you know? So I'm thinking my senior work is gonna be something closer to growing actual food and maybe serving it. I guess I would also add that like, an important part of my plan is that it's kind of based on like a, a personal practical level as opposed to kind of a macro level. So like when I say I wanna study sustainable agriculture, mostly I wanna learn how to actually grow food. Not necessarily like what policy decisions affect, you know, sustainable small-scale farmers, stuff like that. So I'm not, not really interested in like an agroecological experimental design per se, but more just like learning how to actually do it. The main struggle that I'm having right now with my plan is that like, but like to me it just like, it's starting to feel a little bit contrived and maybe that's just you know, maybe that's a passing feeling. Um, that's what I would say to my roommate. I would also add that it's probably going to change quite a bit. You know, every, like when I talk about my plan to everybody, they always tell me that like that you're expected to change your plan quite a bit um, throughout the process. And I guess I, I think that's true and I do expect that quite a bit. So, I mean, that's what the plan is on paper right now. My problem with my plan process is that you're, sp you're supposed to start with an inquiry and then figure out what disciplines feed that inquiry. My problem was that I had way too many disciplines and I didn't know what I was doing. And Jonathan Pinter suggested to me that I find one discipline and from there develop my inquiry and from there figure out what would feed the inquiry and that discipline. While I wasn't sure what discipline I belonged to yet, Eileen Scully looked into my academic soul like three times that term. She would say little things to me after class that would make my mind explode in realization. And the moment, the final moment she looked into my academic soul that term, I was actually walking around in VAPA and Eileen Scully was walking down the hall because she was coming from some cross-disciplinary meeting. And so I looked at her and I teased her and I said, what are you doing in VAPA? And um, she made a joke back saying, oh, you know, I just like to, like, to tour around sometimes, get to know the school. But then she looked at me and she said, look at you, you're, you're happy. I said, 
what? And she said, you never look this happy in my class. She just said that honestly. She said, look, you have a bounce in your step. Eileen Scully, even though she's a history teacher, was the one that made me realize that I'm a drama student. I see it as more of a series, because it is a series of essays and questions and answers to questions, and new questions that might not have answers. Instead of being told what to do, students at Bennington can actually choose what they do by designing their own course of study, following from interests that come from with, inside them, and they connect with all those things outside of them, but not things that are imposed upon them from the outset, which I would argue is a, is a, is a very hard thing to do, or is you know, something that, that is different than simply selecting from a menu and saying, I want to do English, I want to do economics. Maybe I'll do this little sub-area. But you really get to use all the resources that Bennington has and a lot of the resources that we have connected to Bennington from the outside to build what you want to study and what you want to learn and to carry that forward, which I think is really exciting. Sometimes students coming in think that it's completely an open field and that they can do whatever they want, which isn't quite true in the sense of you still need to put together your ideas, map them out, create that provisional version of what you want to study, which creates a lot of demands on your own sense of what you want, who you are, where you want to go, who you want to be. It's kind of, it's really an open field in that sense, but you have to really think of what's possible for you and what's possible at Bennington and how you pull from the various strands that are available to you to move forward and create your path. But it needs to be demonstrated, it needs to be shown. Uh, and that too is thoroughly supervised and tested and often publicly shown. And that can take any number of forms, right? It could be through artwork, it could be through an experiment or a project or a thesis. Um, even students who think they know what they want when they come to Bennington are put through this process of self-reflection, whether it's viable, whether it's something that perhaps they internalize from their parents, or whether it's something that's genuine to themselves. Students have to then write about what they want to study. Uh, they have to propose that to a committee of faculty from across the disciplines that has to be approved. In, in some sense, the plan is is constantly unfolding in the way that you're making a map as you're, as you're discovering what you want and discovering what other people know that contribute to what you want, which can be both exciting and, I think, difficult to deal with because it's never going to sit still for you, the idea is that it continues. Even as you're defending your idea and putting it forward, and elaborating it, studying it, expanding it, it's changing as you go. So it takes a certain kind of resilience and mindset and attitude towards learning and a, and, a, and a comfort with a certain level of uncertainty and a certain level of ambiguity and not too much but enough to really be comfortable with that take it on and feel that this is an exciting place to be in to be in the place of discovering what you want and how to make it real in some sense i think it's it's harder than a traditional major maybe not in terms of the classroom work i think that's very comparable but the work outside of the classroom and the work that goes into Creating your map and creating the, the network of interests is very difficult. But at the same time, it's so, I, I don't hear students saying it's very difficult. I hear them saying this is really exciting. So in some sense, it's, it's demanding. I see it as like you come to it like, oh, you know, my mom used three bar stools, asking a bunch of questions. So I guess this is all around the idea of like, these are questions that have come out of like, you know, a problem or a question or an inquiry of like, you know, how do I design chairs for this kitchen? And there needs to be three of them. They need to, you know, fit around this space. Um, and the counter is 38 inches high. Let's look at the kitchen. What, what are the aesthetics of the kitchen? Um, so I'm thinking about the layout and the spatial conditions that exist in the kitchen. Um, and then thinking about material choice, like what, is, what does steel mean? What does wood mean? What does um, plastic mean? What, is, what, what do we have currently? You, you sort of test things and play with an idea of like, oh, well, what if it, what if like there was wood and steel and what if, you know, like the wood just changed to steel at some point and they were the same thickness and, you know, what about that? Um, and then you got to think about, and of course you have to think about, um, you know, strength, what's going to hold up. These chairs are going to be used a lot. They need to be pushed in and out. You know, my sister likes to lean back on them. So is there a way to like allow for that or can I prevent her from doing that? Um, and then you should think about footrests. And so there's a lot of questions, you know, to think about both aesthetically and functionally 
um, that go into this chair. And then um, you start to make it, and there's a lot of decisions that go into that. You know, you want to use a natural edge, so it's it's kind of weird, and it's hard to clamp it together to get the glue to stick. And from there, you sort of, I guess, you refine your design, and eventually you hopefully have three usable chairs. I guess, it, in a way, it is a planned process, you know? If this were conceptual art, you wouldn't be able to use them in the end, but... It's not so. That's <laughs> why I like. That's why I like design because I, you know, I have something that's. That you can use. I can use. Yeah. We have such a clear idea of at least what the plan is or is supposed to be. There's a process behind it, whereas for senior work, it is literally entirely up to the student to define. Um, what specific project they're doing. First of all, when I decided that this was a topic I wanted to pursue, um, I started studying sociology, anthropology, and uh, taking a lot of Kappa classes in addition to architecture. And um, one of the things that I initially became interested in were market spaces, especially in Accra. Market spaces used to be sort of a cultural center and sort of one of the places where you as a foreigner could have a better understanding of what the place was like. But over years, it has become just really crowded and just not a comfortable space for anyone to be with. So my idea was to think of how the market used to work and try to redevelop what it could be in sort of the modern day Ghana. But because of the distance from Ghana and the fact that this project would require me to, to study the space, first of all, and to have a deeper interaction with people, I decided to use the same idea of people in space and think about Bennington Town. And so my plan has led me to um, redesign Lake Parent, which is a pub public space in Bennington, and think about how it's used by the people and what it could possibly be, aside from just a place where people go to hang out in the summer. I talked to people from the Lake Perrin um, board, as well as people from the town, and sort of got a sense of what it means to them, and also heard their ideas of what could be different, and I used that as well as my personal observations to sort of start to redesign the public space. I think also what kind of morphed in my understanding of the plan was the aspect of how conversational it is um, and that like in, in the conversations you have like as you progress and get a plan committee it's as much of a chance for you to present work or ideas about work as uh, it's also an equal opportunity to ask really any question of, you know, a variety of faculty. And it's really interesting to see kind of what they bring to the table, the literal table. I have the best plan committee in the world because it's Mary, Barry, Carrie, and Robin. <laughs> Kate Dahlenmeyer. No Coburn. Sherry Kramer. Michael Giannitti. Dina Janis. Valerie Ambrose. No Coburn. Barry Bartlett. Jenny Rowan. Liz White. I'm so glad that Dean Randage is doing an otherness class. Donald Sir. Ben John Klein. Kitty Brazelton. Brooke Allen. Kate Purdy. Jenny Rowan. Of Bruce Williamson. Kathleen Dimmick. Marguerite Feitlowitz. Kate Dahlenmeyer. Ron Cohen. Susan Scorbati. Andrew McIntyre. Paul Voice. Betsy Sherman. Kirk Jackson. Ron Cohen. Mia Kaprazak. And Brooke Allen. Warren Cocker. Him. Mary Love, Eileen Scully, Isabel Roche, Dana Red, Jonathan Pinterest, Brooke Allen, Jenny Roan, Alan Sean. It was a very eclectic group, a mixture of people who knew me very well in certain settings, and I feel like everybody was coming in with a very different perception of me as a student. Donald knew me as like this new baby architecture student who like can barely draw and like had all these big dreams, but like not capable of like doing anything really well. And then Kitty kind of saw me as this like really like 
competent person because I kind of excelled in her class and had this very creative sort of picture of me and Valerie had all these struggles with me and Noah didn't know me at all and so it was it was a kind of intimidating group and um but I, I think it was good to have such sort of a mixed group of people who had such different views of me but I'm sure I imagine the planning committee will change quite a bit once I resubmit. The plan is an excellent framework for any sort of way to sort of think about something um, and get to a solution. So it's sort of like, I guess, a problem-solving framework in a way that, you know, okay, I'm interested in these two things, um, and at at some point, a few years down the line, it seems to materialize into something. But I'm going to have all these little experiences and practices and trial steps to get to that point. It may be a totally, it may be totally influenced by something outside of my plan, but it may also be the realization of my plan. The, um, the science faculty talked pretty well about this. When the outside reviewers came to evaluate the program, and they came away really impressed with how they, how they do their work, how they help the students really understand science in a deep way. And the things like um, they always use original primary sources. They do their own experiments, right? There are no lab assistants who are setting up the experiments for them. They're, doing, they're actually doing the work that scientists do alongside of other scientists. And, and they have a strong structure for guiding students. Um, and that's, this is where the plan committees and the faculty on them can really gauge, is the work developing? Is it getting more complex? Is the thinking about this this issue really sophisticated? Is it is the student making the connections that he or she ne- needs to make? Seeing you know uh, larger parts of the field, or is it really because you do occasionally encounter students who are just kind of staying at the you know at the sort of median level? And I think the I think the faculty would say, and I would agree that there is a I wouldn't say it's a moment, but there is a threshold that is crossed. You, you can see all the markers, right? You can see that there's, the, there's, a, there's a level of difficulty. There's a challenge, and a challenge over time. There's a level of engagement that is needed, and, and even just work. Right? Putting in the time to figure something out or to, you know, conduct the experiment. And seeing that through, not just setting up the idea, but seeing it through and then rounding it off and summarizing it and saying, this is what happened, this is what I learned, this is what I can contribute. And that was one thing Donald said to me when I went to him, I said, I don't know if I want to be an architect. He's like, who gives a shit? Like, you don't have to be an architect. But I knew from that moment on that studying architecture was very important. Whether or not I was an architect, it just opened up all these doors for me. It meant that I could study so many other things because it informs architecture. I think your plan essay writing ends, but I don't think the plan ends in the mind because it it is really kind of a new way of thinking. I think graduate studies, but that's also that was also one reason I took a term off to see, kind of orient myself again, to see what is do, what I can do or what I want to do after graduation and not to get too fixed to Bennington actually too, because I was, yeah, just you get very involved in Bennington and just to be able to see the outside world also. So uh, I do want to go to grad school and continue kind of more, I guess, the more directive um, thing to become more specialized, I guess, or to, to know more about something. But I'm also open to have maybe, as international students, we have the OPT option, so to have one year working in the U.S., so that's a possibility. So I'm not too fixed, but I'm glad I still have one more year (laughs) to think about that. My plan is to move to New York and audition for everything and anything. I I act self-deprecating about it because people's reaction to that is often, oh, what are you going to do after that? Or, you know, or the implication is, what do you do when you inevitably fail? Um, <laughs> which, you know, it, I understand the reaction, but I want to be an actor, so I'm going to be an actor.
you encounter people like this um, in the world, and hopefully we all have some of these qualities, but people who are constantly working on their map, constantly editing their text. What I mean, of course, is these are just metaphors for their lives, but really thinking about what they're working on and where they want to go, and who are not bound to the conventions of that. So, but really not seeing the, the usual pathways and the usual careers as limitations to what they can do, but really seeing the whole field. I mean, the, the phrase that's commonly applied to this is that in, in the most sort of um, uninteresting way is lifelong learning, right? But the people that w in, in whom I recognize Bennington are like that. I mean, they may have not have been to Bennington, they may have not have even heard of it, but you recognize it in a certain approach to life and a certain ambitiousness, actually. And so part of what we're trying to do is to cultivate that capacity within students to think that way and to live that way. I think everyone has this capacity. It's a matter of, of awakening, it, awakening it if it's not already there, and then of creating just enough structure and just enough awareness for that student to begin developing on his or her own that capacity, sometimes without even knowing it explicitly. And that's what the plan process does. It allows you to let, let that capacity to really live an ambitious life unfold with the structures that we have to support it. So we're kind of educating towards that. And it's not separate from the content that they're simultaneously working with, right? So you have the, the rigor of, you know, reading the texts and writing the papers and doing the experiments and spending all night in the studio and developing your idea for your painting. But it is not just about the content, it's about the process carrying the content forward. Sections would like to thank Asa Learmouth, Brendan Tang, Ben Redmond, Carlos Torres, Mitchell Carson, Colin Hinckley, Glennis Henderson, Kate Howard, Olivia Gerber, Kelly Nichols Hoppy, Maya Villa, and Anna Reggio for their time and their thoughts. Music provided by Jason Moon of Cordova, Dachshund Zygmunt and Kuba Vaskevich of VJ Memes, Tom Bogdan, Daniel Winninger, Alan Sean, Seth Katz, Olivia Gerber, Carlos Torres, and Atticus Lazenby. Cross Sections is edited and produced by Keegan Eid and Alex Diaz. As always, thank you for listening.